Support for the Legislative Gazette comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. Governor Andrew Cuomo held a unity event this week with Eric Adams, the winner of the Democratic primary for New York City mayor. The Legislative Gazette's Karen DeWitt reports they announced plans to combat rising gun violence. I am so excited about Eric Adams. Cuomo, who has bitterly feuded with the present mayor and former ally Bill de Blasio, says things will be different if Adams, as expected, wins the general election in November. Courage and competence, and I believe... Eric Adams has both those elements, and I pledge today to work in full partnership with him. The governor, who's had an antagonistic relationship with the left of his party, says he and Adams come from the same political philosophy and hold similar views of what it means to be a progressive. The governor mocked left-leaning Democrats as wanting a utopia, and he said he and the Democratic nominee for mayor are more practical. Adams agrees, saying he and Cuomo see eye to eye and cannot let the term progressive be hijacked. I am the face of the Democratic Party. Those countless number of men and women, everyday workers, that they want safe streets, they want their children educated, they want to stop hearing gunshots instead of alarm clocks. The two announced that 4,000 summer jobs will be made available to at-risk youth, as well as training for permanent employment. The program is part of a previously announced gun violence state of emergency by Cuomo, which comes as rates of shootings have risen in the state's major cities. Cuomo's plan does not include revisiting recently enacted changes to the state's criminal justice system, including ending most forms of cash bail and treating 16 and 17 17-year-old criminal defendants as juveniles in family court and not as adults facing confinement in state prison. Critics say that has led some teens to be less fearful of consequences if they are caught carrying or using a gun. Adams, a former police officer, says the measures might need to be tweaked. Yes, we need to look at all of these new laws that are taking place and don't have unattended consequences based on how we enact them. Adams says prosecutors could make better use of existing laws, like Kendra's law, which allows for court-ordered mental health treatment. And he blames the state's judges, who he says have thrown up their hands and are not imposing cash bail even when they're allowed to under the new laws. But Adams says more focus needs to be on prevention and providing services so that people don't resort to crime and violence. He says he does not want to return to the days of heavy-handed policing. The joint appearance comes as Cuomo faces numerous scandals, including multiple allegations of sexual harassment and, in one case, sexual assault. The state's attorney general, Letitia James, is conducting an investigation. Adams is not among many prominent Democratic elected politicians who have called on Cuomo to resign, but he did say during the primary that when powerful men prey on women, swift action must be taken against them. Adams says he backs the AG's investigation and wants to hear its results. Let the investigation go to its outcome. I mean, that's the system of justice that I protected in the city and will continue to do so. And the system of investigation will determine the outcome of that. Federal prosecutors are also looking into accusations that Cuomo and his top aides hid from the public the true number of nursing home deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Cuomo is also facing an impeachment inquiry from the state assembly over additional allegations that he gave family and friends special access to COVID tests and used staff to help him write a $5 million message. Memoir. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. Joining us now, Legislative Gazette political observer Alan Chartalk. Alan? New York Governor Andrew Cuomo lavished praise on Democratic mayoral nominee Eric Adams during a joint appearance in Brooklyn. The glad handing says the New York Times expected between like-minded Democrats following an election comes as Cuomo is in a battle for his political future. And Adams is still basking in his primary win, fresh from a meeting this week At the White House, while the governor gushed over Adams during a joint press conference on gun violence, the Democratic nominee focused more on his own record than that of a governor whose compounding scandals have imperiled his political future. 
quote, Eric Adams is going to be the next mayor of the city of New York, and I am very, very excited about that, Cuomo said. He's going to be extraordinary. Adams appeared to think so, too, Allen, and kept the attention on himself. I am the face of the Democratic Party, he said during his turn at the podium. I am the original progressive voice in this city. What do you make of the joint appearance? Well, I make enough of it to tell you that I wrote my column, which comes out on Saturday on this, and there's a lot that this presumed incoming mayor has. Obviously, if Cuomo is looking to be elected governor for a fourth term, he's going to need the black vote. This is now an election in which incoming Mayor Adams, because I think that's what he is, has a great deal to offer to Cuomo. And Cuomo, for his part, and Adams knows, will be able to deliver for the city. We know that de Blasio, who had some good words for Adams, is a fierce enemy of the governor. If, in fact, it turns out that de Blasio is calling the shots in any way, I think this could ruin this relationship. But I think both men have reasons for a good relationship. And I think that we're going to see they understand that. But yes, I think the article that you were reading from, David, is correct that Adams has basically the upper hand here. But remember, as I have taught in political science classes for so many years, the city is a creature of the state. And if a war broke out between those two men, it wouldn't be good for either of them. But in terms of the resources for the city, it certainly wouldn't be good for Adams. But do I believe that he has the upper hand now? Yes, I do. Is he a real progressive, Adams? Well, based on his rhetoric, based on the things he's calling for, the answer is yes. Of course, the Democratic Party is split into many different factions, some as the, what I would call the left, 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 and nothing will ever be enough for some of those folks, even though they may be right in what they aspire to. So if you say Adams to most political scientists and people who are watching this, they're going to tell you that he is a moderate. He has progressive tendencies, so I would expect that as you usual, the Democrats will quickly form into a circular firing squad and start shooting at each other. So the governor making nice with Eric Adams, but he certainly didn't make nice with the former mayor, Bill de Blasio. Historically bad relationship. That's right. You know, I've always felt that Andrew Cuomo, who I have sometimes dubbed tough guy Andrew, has a basic philosophy of if you're not me, you're not that good. He's a guy who picks fights with a lot of people. And he, when he wants to, you know, he casts them aside. I've just written a column in which I try to figure out who his friends are. In any case, the point is that Bill de Blasio was a fierce enemy of Governor Cuomo, and de Blasio has shown some affinity for Eric Adams, the incoming mayor, we think. And in that case, Cuomo is going to absolutely need Adams more than Adams needs Cuomo. After all, the governor has a lot of controls. Adams is going to need the governor. Assuming the governor gets to be governor again, he's going to need him. And that sets up a mutual dependency between the two men. But of course, Adams is black and Cuomo absolutely needs the black vote. Adams has recruited none other than Al Sharpton to be part of his inner circle and is appearing with him. Cuomo knows that this is an imperative that he get along with Adams. That's all there is to it. You spoke with the controller of the state of New York this week, Tom DiNapoli, and a lot of the conversation centered around the issue of who will run for governor not on the Republican side, but on the Democratic side. And it depends on a lot of things, including, most importantly, these various investigations looking into the governor's behavior and what they will find. And the rumor that's out there is that the controller is interested. He tried to tamp that down on the show with you. But as we say in the common parlance, he didn't rule it out completely. Hey, David, I have nothing but respect for Tom DiNapoli. I think by far he is the best political leader we have in New York State right now. He's done an admirable job as the controller, and he would be an excellent governor. And you would not find the kinds of problems you have found with Cuomo if DiNapoli were the governor. Nevertheless, it's going to be a tough road for him. People don't really know who he is. They don't really know what he does. If they did, they would vote for him. But there's also the matter of a very ambitious attorney general, Tish James, who many people think would be the one who, if Cuomo vacated the office, would run. 
There are those who think, I'm not one of them, that she'll have the guts to run against him in a primary. And you never can tell how that goes. But Cuomo has basically denounced both to Shames and DiNapoli and said they're interested in politics. Yeah, right. And he's not. So we'll see. But if any of these investigations land on Cuomo and he's forced to resign, then you got a whole new ball game. Do I think that that's going to happen at this stage? Probably not. I think you can look forward to another Cuomo administration. That would be his fourth term. Legislative Gazette political observer, Alan Shartok. You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, program about New York State government and politics. I'm David Gustina. A week ago, Governor Andrew Cuomo declared a state of disaster emergency over gun violence across New York and announced $138 million in new spending to try to stop the surge in shootings, including in New York's capital city. The Legislative Gazette's Dave Lucas has reaction from Albany City officials. On July 6th, Cuomo, a Democrat, unveiled a seven-point plan calling gun violence an emergency public health issue, announcing $138 million in new spending to try to stop the surge in shootings. Republican Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro, who ran against Cuomo in 2018, says if this is really the emergency Cuomo has declared it to be, he would immediately issue orders reversing bail reforms. Unless they are willing to suspend aspects of cashless bail and return some discretion uh, to judges, uh, then this is not a serious effort. Uh, with all due respect, uh, what uh, uh, the governor and, quite frankly, the Democratic majority in both houses have created is a criminal justice system that uh, now in, empowers criminals and, and in, almost encourages individuals uh, to continue break the law without uh, incentives not to. Democratic Albany County D.A. David Soares says bail and discovery reform impacts people of color and communities of color throughout the capital region. He recently published a blistering op-ed on the issue in the New York Post. Governor Cuomo's uh, efforts to run away from the very criminal justice reforms uh, that have put us, you know, in, in the in the circumstances that we're all experiencing right now. And when I say we are all experiencing, let, let us Let us be very clear that we are experiencing this differently than the people who have to to, uh, labor under uh, the burden of of those reforms. And the people that I am referring to are the victims of crime that continue to have to live in communities where shootings uh, are the norm. Capital Region cases include several shootings involving then 17-year-old Jarrell Howard, sentenced to prison a year ago in connection with a daytime incident where a three-year-old was shot in the arm while sleeping inside a daycare. While Howard was free, he was accused in several Albany shootings, including a homicide days before his sentencing. Democratic Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan says there's no simple answer to the challenges the community is facing. It's far too simplistic to just point to one thing, you know, bail reform, for example, and say that that is the cause. We can't point to one thing, you know, of COVID being the cause. This is complex, and we, uh, you know, I I think it's misleading to suggest that there's a simple solution to this. Um, You know, we had a a justice system that cut, that shut down. You know, our courts are just beginning to reopen, and so there are multi layers to this. I think that we have to talk about um, what we can be doing, you know, with the county um, and working with other partners, for example, on pre-trial supervision. What are the other things that we need to put in place in order to ensure that, um, you know, bail reform works um, the way that it was intended to? 
Congressman Paul Tonko, also a Democrat, says lawmakers can update national policies, including background checks, stopping weapons transfers across state borders, and more. Well, I think every common sense approach should be taken to addressing violence in our communities. Um, You know, the stats out there are pretty alarming, and I think it's important for us to utilize whatever tools we have in government, policies, Uh, laws that can be enacted, resources that can be advanced to address safety. Soares says the state must give judges discretion to keep dangerous offenders in jail. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Dave Lucas. Affordable housing has become a major issue in New York and around the country. To that end, officials cut the ribbon this week on a new affordable housing development in Saratoga Springs, a city upstate that is becoming an increasingly expensive place to live. The Legislative Gazette's Lucas Willard was there and filed this report. Saratoga Springs has a growing population and cost of living. According to the latest census figures, the spa city's median home value was more than $365,000, almost $150,000 higher than the statewide median value. Outside the brand new Promenade Apartments on Tuesday, Saratoga Springs Housing Authority Executive Director Paul Feldman reflected on the long-standing issue of rising housing prices. When I started here about five or six years ago, I was uh, meeting with various um, stakeholders in the community room and it became very apparent that there was a severe shortage of affordable housing up here in Saratoga Springs. We had commissioned a market study that Um, discovered that something like a thousand new units of housing was built in the last decade. None of it, none of it was affordable. The Promenade Apartments complex includes 63 units for low and moderate income individuals. Ten units are reserved for veterans. Planning for the $20 million project began four years ago. Saratoga Springs Mayor Meg Kelly, a Democrat, spoke at Tuesday's press conference on behalf of the city council. We all worked together for the last few years on this, uh, any affordable project, housing project that has come across our, our table. I think it's critical that we have people that can afford to live here and work here, and that's our mission at the City Council. The project includes a four-story building with 41 units, as well as three rows of townhomes. Promenade Apartments is located next to the Stonequist Apartments Tower, not far from downtown. Darren Scott is Upstate East Director of Development at New York State Homes and Community Renewal, the state agency that supported the project. Communities like Saratoga Springs thrive and become even more vibrant when the individuals and families who work here can afford to live here. Unfortunately, the rising cost of housing in the capital region has meant that many hardworking New Yorkers are being priced out entirely or forced to live in substandard housing. Scott said he hoped the pandemic brought a little bit of an awakening to the need for affordable housing. Right now, we are in the final year of Governor Cuomo's unprecedented $20 billion five-year housing plan to build and preserve more than 100,000 affordable homes and 6,000 with supportive services. And while I have an audience, I just want to put a plug in for a second housing plan. It's very much needed. Also on hand Tuesday, State Senator Daphne Jordan and Assemblywoman Carrie Warner presented citations from the New York State Legislature to mark the development. North Star Development partnered with firm Bonaccio Construction and designers Balzer & Tuck Architecture and the L.A. Group to build the project. Feldman said the project shows the amount of support for affordable development in the spa city, not just among city officials, but also neighbors. We received nothing but support for this project. So the narrative that was out there that the city was going to fight affordable housing just wasn't true. And I'm finding that as I move forward with our other projects as well. Also in the works, a 24-unit housing development in the area of East Fenland Street and Vanderbilt Avenue and the potential renovation of the Stonequist Apartments Tower. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Lucas Willard. You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. Kingston, New York, is now home to a mental health substance use urgent care facility. It comes as Ulster County has been reeling from an escalation of mental health and drug addiction issues during COVID and the reduction of related inpatient beds. The Legislative Gazette's Allison Dunn reports. 
The June opening of the Ulster Mental Health and Substance Use Urgent Care came as a partnership between nonprofit Hudson Valley-based Access Supports for Living and Ulster County, where Pat Ryan is county executive. We're coming off of one of the hardest years, of course, in, in, in all of our lifetimes, but in particular, we've seen in Ulster County a real exacerbation of the mental health and uh, addiction crises. We had suicides in Ulster County double from, from the previous year, fatal overdoses uh, up 93%. In Ulster County. Ryan says the uptick in numbers occurred in 2020 as compared to 2019. In May, the Democratic County Executive formed a countywide behavioral health task force to identify gaps in the mental health and addiction landscape to inform potential investments. The walk in mental health and substance use urgent care in Midtown Kingston is among the first outcomes. The same way we treat uh, a broken bone or, or a, a sprained ankle where you can show up to an urgent care and walk in and get the care you need. We want to have that same level of service and seriousness towards the, the mental health needs of the community. Ron Colavito is president and CEO of Access Supports for Living. He says the urgent care center is in a building attached to Health Alliance Hospital. So I'm happy to have people, you know, seek, you know, seek services there in a, um, in a friendly, non-stigmatizing way. You know, it's, it's an urgent care. Walk in and get services, including access to psychiatry. In spring of 2019, Access opened two mental health and substance use urgent care centers in Orange County, in Middletown and Newburgh, with the help of federal funding. In two years, more than 4,000 people have received care at the Orange County urgent care facilities, a majority having never previously done so with Access. This includes the use of telehealth services. At the time, Colavito said he thought the facilities were the first of their kind in the region, if not the state. Calavito says the urgent care facility in Kingston builds on Ulster County's mobile mental health team. So the county funds the mobile mental health team that we actually, um, we're actually the service provider for. The Kingston project differs from the other two. We are adding essentially another mobile component um, for a nursing care management function that will be able to come to people's homes or anywhere in the community that, that works for them to support people seeking treatment for opioids in particular, so that there's more of an outreach. That's in addition to come see us in the center or call us. This is, we're going to come to you and try to make that work and serve people kind of really where they are in a system and connecting to support. Because we don't want to create a scenario where when people, you know, in the middle of a crisis have to go figure out the complex healthcare system, um, we we want to simplify that, bring the services to them and help them navigate Um, seeking treatment um, when they're ready to do so. The Orange County locations added 24-7 virtual care during the COVID crisis, and Kingston has the same round-the-clock virtual service. Michael Berg is executive director of Kingston-based Family of Woodstock, which provides services throughout Ulster County. We're, We're desperately in need of more mental health services. And the fact that there's now a walk-in place that is presenting that it can provide service on a walk-in basis is terrific. It doesn't replace the need for more um, ongoing uh, uh, service, but it is a good emergency addition. We certainly will use it and refer to it, and I'm sure that they will refer to us as well. The Kingston facility came together in about a month's time with funding from both Access and Ulster County. Ryan says he was able to leverage some federal funding for addressing the opioid crisis to help set up the urgent care center. While COVID escalated the need for such services, Ryan says the demand existed well before the pandemic. And now, he says, Health Alliance cutting the county's only inpatient mental health and chemical dependency services exacerbates the problem. To be clear, the the, the urgent care, the mental health urgent care is not meant to be a replacement for some of the inpatient beds that we lost, which we're still working hard to return. Um, But this helps address um, some of the gap left by that while we continue to work to bring those beds back. He says nine months ago, Health Alliance shut down 40 inpatient mental health beds and 20 beds dedicated to chemical dependency and detoxification to make room for a potential regional COVID-19 specialized care center. Ryan thought the move was temporary. Health Alliance of the Hudson Valley responded in a statement, saying the community continues to have access to behavioral health services in Ulster County and that the long-established access point in the county for anyone in need of such services continues to be the emergency department at Health Alliance Hospital in Kingston, which is open 24-7. 
Patients in need of acute inpatient substance abuse services can be admitted to Health Alliance Hospital on Broadway. Inpatient mental health services are available at Westchester Medical Center Health's Mid-Hudson Regional Hospital in Poughkeepsie. The statement adds that, quote, Outpatient care for a range of behavioral health conditions is now considered a national norm in this evolving area of health care, and the majority of individuals seeking behavioral health assistance at Health Alliance Hospital are treated and released. To support community needs, Health Alliance offers outpatient behavioral health and primary care services, such as addiction treatment programs, rehabilitation services, and a methadone clinic. We have also participated in briefings with locally elected officials, state agencies, and other stakeholders regarding additional short- and long-term solutions for behavioral health services in the area, including the possibility of permanent relocation of behavioral health beds to Mid-Hudson Regional Hospital, end quote. Ryan has petitioned state officials, asking that they require Health Alliance to return the inpatient beds. Calavito says the reduction in beds creates more of a need to provide bridge medications. Part of what's been really successful in our urgent care model, um, in addition to just the volume of people we're seeing, is the volume of bridge prescriptions we're able to provide um, for people to you know, remain on, on medications that are important to them and important to their, their mental health and, 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 and health-related substance use. Calavito says there are no immediate plans to further expand, though the model is replicable, and he will explore where else in the Hudson Valley it makes sense. Here's Ryan. Well, I hope that this meets a lot of the immediate need, um, definitely in the sort of Kingston area and, and the northern part of the county. If this is a success, we would love to do more of these kinds of partnerships and, and initiatives with Access or, or with other partners. I mean, I think what we're trying to do here and what I've tried to do on, on many fronts is in the midst of this crisis, let's use it as an opportunity to try to be both creative and compassionate in delivering these kinds of services. The Ulster Mental Health and Substance Use Urgent Care is open for in-person services 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and virtually 24-7. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Allison Dunn. And that about does it for this week's show. We had help from the New York State Public Radio Network. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262. Ask for program number 2129. Or just listen or schedule a podcast on the web at wamc.org. And join us again next week at this same time. For more news on New York State government and politics, for the Legislative Gazette, I'm David Gustino.